credits. Disciples in the Power of Faith. How to Make Your Story of Christian Authority and Rise Above Mountains by Terrence Woolburn. Read for you by the author. This has been an audiobook of Disciples in the Power of Faith. How to Make Your Story of Christian Authority and Rise Above Mountains by Terrence Woolburn. Read to you by the author. This has also been a production of Wilburn Media. Copyright 2018, Wilburn Media. Copyright 2018 by Terrence Wilburn. I would love to hear back from you how this teaching has been a blessing to you. It's affected your life in any kind of way. Would you email me at wilburnmedia at gmail.com? That's W I L B U R N M E D I A at gmail.com email me day or night let me know how this audiobook has been a blessing to you if you have any suggestions or comments reach me at willburnmedia at gmail.com that's w-i-l-b-u-r-n m-e-d-i-a at gmail.com any suggestions how I can make this teaching better I'd love to hear back from you would you contact me today Let me know how this teaching has been a blessing to you. If you have any suggestions on how I can make this improvement, let me know again. That's wilburnmedia at gmail.com. I want to thank you again for listening. Remember to keep the faith, trust God, and put Christ first. Thank you again. Do you want to experience the power of God? Hi, I want to thank you personally for listening to this book. Never before has God's power been so influential in the lives of people across the globe. Every month I release a prophetic newsletter for those who want to know and grow in what God is doing today. Your efforts to search God's word shows that you are serious about your spiritual walk with God. My gift to you, I want you to visit www.terrencewilburn.com forward slash newsletter to get your free newsletter. Again, that's www.terrencewilburn.com forward slash newsletter. Find out what God is really saying to you and what you should do about it. Just click to subscribe and I'll send it right out. Thank you. Preface. For ages, the Christian, the Jew, and much of the known world has known the name of David. People of every nation and tongue have heard the legend. They know the story of the great giant Goliath and the little shepherd boy from Israel who defeated him with just a rock and a sling in an amazing battle of sharp wits versus tremendous strength and might. From the playground to the boardroom, you have been captured by the allure of allegory to the heights of David's greatest victories and achievements when he should have known the lowest of depths as a single person has ever known. In the 23rd Psalm, David revealed the secrets to his warfare, and millions today have known it to be the most comforting scripture ever written. You may have always wondered exactly how one man could have possibly done these things. Find out how when you visit Psalm23Secrets.com. But what you should know is you can do the same when you understand what he did. There are keys to having the victory with God over the enemy. In this audiobook, I'm going to teach you the six secrets of David and how you can obtain them to become great in God's kingdom on earth. With the six keys of David, you can live like a warrior, fight every battle with ease and peace of mind. Know that God is on your side. You will come in the power of his spirit and his might. You will call on the name of the living God and be heard. Feed the enemy to the beasts of the field. 1 Samuel 17, 44. Chapter 1. The Spirit of the Lord. The Lord is my strong tower. Psalms 61 verse 3. These are the sayings of a man in the Bible who had confidence in the Lord. He had confidence after Abraham, but before Zechariah, that the Spirit of the Lord would give him help to discover the answers to life's most difficult problems. That man was David. He had a confidence that soared beyond imagination, a confidence that was built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness, the coming Savior. But what is the Spirit of the Lord? Is it a special spirit that comes upon you when you call out for it, when you're tossed into the lion's den? Is it a spirit that is like a dove that comes upon you so everyone will know when you've been baptized? 
Is it a hovering, fluffy white cloud that keeps you free from sunburn or keeps you in the fire cozy for the chilly nights while in the desert? Well, the short answer is no. But the extended proof of the power of this spirit is a resounding yes. That's right. The spirit of the Lord is a person. And knowing this is just the beginning of great things to come for you. So let's take a more in-depth look at the phrase, the spirit of the Lord. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the living God. Zechariah 4, verse 6. This is a quote from the holy prophet Zechariah, detailing how the spirit of the living God assists his people in time of need. In Hebrews, the writer says that you can receive grace to help in times of need when you approach God in boldness of faith. That's Hebrews 4, verse 16. The Spirit of the living God is whom Jesus called the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the third member of the Godhead. The Godhead is what most evangelicals consider as the Trinity. The Trinity is the operational ministry of God called by Jesus as the Father, a heavenly Father, the Son, Jesus Christ himself, and Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord. See verses Matthew 3, verse 16, Mark 1, verse 10, Luke 3, verse 22, and John chapter 1, verse 32. Each having their own distinct personality and cohesively operating as one. Think about a boardroom full of CEOs. They are all individuals but operate as one corporation. Your relationship to the Heavenly Father is built upon prayer. Prayer is a simple intimacy of conversation between you and him. In regards to Jesus, the Son, or the Christ, is more than just your Savior. He is your brother and friend in the faith who shares in your griefs and who intercedes for you to the Heavenly Father daily. Lastly, the Holy Spirit is your helper and teacher. He is also known as a comforter that is with you to strengthen you. See Acts 1 verse 8. It's vital that you understand your relationship to the Godhead. But it's okay if you don't understand everything right away. God loves you as you are. But you should make it a priority to call upon the Spirit of the Lord because the Holy Spirit can empower you to do great things just like David. Read 1 Samuel chapter 17. Chapter 2. The Heart of God. Create in me a clean heart. Psalms 24, verse 4. Psalms 51, verse 10. And Psalms 73, verse 1. Like David, you must constantly take a look at the intentions of the heart, your heart. In order to qualify for the heart of God, you must master decision making, the reason why you are doing something. Take a moment to honestly review a few of the behaviors, attitudes, or reasons why you're doing things for other people. Go ahead. I'll wait. Okay, did you have a come to Jesus moment yet? I'm trusting that you did before you continue to listen to this audio tape. It's important that you did the exercise. If you didn't, go ahead and take a moment to do so. I'll wait. Going ahead. Now that you know your motive behind what you're doing, I hope it's the right one. But how would you know what is your plumb line? One way to know is to have a specific goal in mind, and that is to know the will of the Heavenly Father, your Heavenly Father. I'm assuming that you've heard of the prodigal son. He would have known this all too well, because for a season he served his father without complaint, while inwardly burning to desire to get whatever he felt was owed to him, which was the intentions of his heart. And when he got what he wanted, he broke camp. His loyalty was tested and he was found without honor, which is why he got all of what he wanted from a few years of playing nice. But he failed to do what his elder brother had done, which is remain faithfully performing his father's business. By leaving the father's house, the prodigal son learned a difficult life lesson, but a profitable one, that his heart was not towards the heart of his father. All the time, he hadn't known that a father's will is to provide for his son or daughter. But as soon as the prodigal found out the intentions of his own heart, which was a come to Jesus moment, like you had at the beginning of this chapter, after a long season of dining with the pigs, which represented his troubled and contentious heart. He came to his senses and returned to his rightful place at the father's house. If you hadn't read the story in a while, just read Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. 
It's one of Jesus' greatest parables to glean from. It's easily relatable, as well as we all know a prodigal in one way or another, and maybe you can see a little bit of your own family in that story as well. So the key to have the heart of God is to first think about your own intentions. Ask the Father to renew your heart and forgiveness for your sins and cleanse your heart of any unknown things that may be stopping you from a breakthrough. David had a heart after God because of the relationship of trust he had with God, which begins when he understood that one day a purposeful relationship with the Lord is better than thousands elsewhere. Psalm 84 verse 10. Do you have that kind of relationship with God or are you a prodigal? Before you continue to the next chapter, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal the secrets of your heart because in the next chapter, you will begin to understand the purpose of desire as I outline for you how to take your relationship with the Father to the next level and beyond. Chapter 3, The Prayer of Faith. Now, therefore, I pray thee, let my Lord the King hear the words of his servant. 1 Samuel 26, verse 19. David definitely had a way with words. He understood that the right words could change his fate because he had mastered even what the disciples of Jesus had yet to learn. The Prayer of Faith. The prayer in the book of Matthew, known as the Lord's Prayer, was given by Jesus to his disciples after they asked, Master, teach us to pray. Jesus responded with, Our Father, which art in heaven. Matthew 6, verse 9. Okay, from here the story gets a little tricky, so I'll stick to the basics. The disciples had been having some difficulty with results when praying for people to be healed, but when they saw that Jesus didn't have that problem, the obvious thing to do was to ask, teach us to pray. The funny thing is, they already knew how to pray. The disciples were devout Jewish men who lived in a closely knit society who carried a long history of religious acts. They were the people who knew the living God. What they really want were immediate results, like they saw in Jesus' ministry and prayer life. They wanted to know how to achieve the same success in ministry. So he turned their intentions instead to relationship to God and taught them the purpose of prayer, which is to remain in relationship to the Heavenly Father. This was David's key to heaven, and it's yours if you listen with scrutiny. Jesus paid it all on the cross. Now you have access to God. The greatest revelation entire history of humankind is that omnipresent, omnipotent, sovereign, creator God desires a conversation with us, finite, infinitesimal, undeserving mankind. But Jesus made all of that possible. Wow! That deserves a praise break right there. God can be accessed through prayer, and we know how to pray because the Son of God taught you and I by showing us the nature of His relationship. That's mind-blowing, don't you think? You might say, wait, you're telling me when I receive the Spirit of the Lord at salvation and I ask God to cleanse my heart, which is my intentions, that's when I could come to Him with right purpose and all my thoughts about what's going on in my life, God hears that? Yes, that's right, because from the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. Matthew 12, verse 34. But if you want to have power like David, your relationship to God must go beyond mere words. He has to have all of you or it's no deal. But wait, there's hope. Prayer is the key because it opens us up to conversation with God. He already knows you. He knows your name, your address, where you work, your family. God knows your failures, your sins, your past hurts, and your current troubles. He knows it all, but he is persistent in his wants to know you, all of you. You may be asking right now, if God knows me, why do I have to pray? Because when you do what Jesus said to pray, you'll be blessed. And if you don't, the opposite is true. What Jesus was saying was, a child of God must realize his or her own relationship to God. They should know that a good father is a protector, is faithful, and is a trusted friend. That's who the Heavenly Father desires to be with you. An earthly father may see his children not doing good and wants to help. But if the child never asks for help, the father will not offer any assistance. 
even though he may desire to. A good father wants to be invited into the lives of his children, not be a bully who forces himself into every event of their life. Think again about the abandoned father in the parable of the prodigal son. He patiently waited in hope every day for his lost son to return. It's likely that although he didn't know where he could be, he would have desperately traveled near and far to find him. The same is true with God. He wants to be where you are right now. So open your mouth, lift your voice and cry, Abba, my father, I'm coming home to you in Jesus name. Friend, God wants to do great things in your life. But like David, you must use the key of prayer to find out how to do just that. Log on to TerrenceWilburn.com to get the six secrets of prayer. Chapter 4, The Power of the Dance David danced before the Lord with all his might. 2 Samuel 6, verse 14 There was a party going on in Israel. David had captured the Ark of the Covenant and was ready to celebrate. The Spirit of the Lord God had returned to Israel, and David was so happy that he danced excitedly until his outer garments came off. Why? Because there is power in the dance. You know this if you've ever stepped into a Pentecostal church, as some people dance to the music in celebration. The power of the dance can shake mountains of sadness, move an audience to tears, and unite families as they hold hands in the dance and tread over all the enemies of God. Have you ever seen that movie Footloose? In case you haven't, you should know that in the 1980s, it was the biggest movie on the planet. It starred actor Kevin Bacon as a rebellious teenager who moves from a big city to a small town. When he arrives, he finds opposition in a community obsessed with the sinless preacher, who is intent on perfecting the citizens through a no-dancing prohibition. When I saw that movie as a kid, I didn't understand the complexity of its stereotypes. To be honest, I thought it was quite dumb. But actually, my young mind couldn't grasp why wouldn't people not want to dance? You see, dancing is natural. It's like breathing. It's a pure function of being spiritual carried out through your physical body. The act of what's carried out in the dance depends on the spirit of the person. Now I can see the realism in that movie. The people wanted to be free of religious oppression and the religious leaders who abuse their power over the people. But let's turn that around. Next time someone tells you dancing is not of God, think of David. Whenever he felt the power of God moving, he danced. Psalm 149 verse 3. You're probably asking, why is David's dancing so important to Christians now? And why is it ever mentioned in the Bible in the first place? That's because indignant people perceived it as indecent and of the devil. True, some dances can be salacious, especially today. Everything seems to be rated R. Speaking of which, another 80s blockbuster, Dirty Dancing, showed us the power of that kind of dance. In fact, I find it hard to believe that people were actually doing that kind of stuff before that movie was produced. Fast forward to about 30 years now, and the girls keep getting younger, and the dances keep getting dirtier. Like it or not, it's here to stay, and it's become the norm. Some people may watch shows like Dancing with the Stars, or the raunchier shows like So You Think You Can Dance, and say that dancing is wrong and is from the devil. I wouldn't say all that. In my opinion, watching them could possibly be the most boring thing one could do on a weeknight. But maybe watching people have fun is more fun than people having fun themselves. Regardless, but they forgot all about the holy dance and the celebration of victory, treading over the enemy with praise. David understood this, but was looked upon as indecent. He was downgraded by onlookers, especially his wife. But God was watching. David's dance was recorded by Bible writers so that you and people of all ages would know that it's okay to express yourself by dancing. So right now, get up and stomp on the devil's head with a victory lap of praise around your living room. And if anybody asks you, what's gotten into you? Tell them the spirit of the living God did. And right now I'm going to show my thanks by giving God praise. Like David, when God has returned to your house, it's time to celebrate. When you do, just make sure you have better moves than the people at the closing credits of Footloose. Just YouTube that scene and you'll be laughing for days. Chapter 5, The Song of Rejoicing. With gladness, 
and rejoicing shall they be brought. They shall enter into the king's palace. Psalms 45, 15. David was a prophet, much like other notable figures in the Bible, such as Abraham to Moses and Samuel. His name is mentioned over 1,000 times in the Bible. David is the only man Jesus talked about more than himself, so much that Jesus was named the son of David. See scriptures in the following PDF at TerrenceWilburn.com forward slash the song of rejoicing. David had the whole package. He was a gifted singer slash songwriter and instrumentalist. He wrote many songs that memorialize the mighty works of God for the future generations of believers like you and I. In his day, he was something like the John Cougar Mellencamp or Mick Jagger of his day. David was very rich. He was a great fighter, a smooth operator, aka a ladies man. To top that, he was also handsome, a good dancer, and could sing like an angel from heaven. He is credited as one of the world's greatest authors. He wrote 75 or one half of the 150 Psalms and at least one of the two parts known as the book of Samuel. David's work is now published in the greatest selling book of all time, the Bible. Wow, wouldn't you like a bio like that? Don't you agree that pursuing a Davidic anointing is the best? David wrote about all the problems he had with friends and with enemies and would sing them to the Lord. But a product of hope sprouted forth from all of those terrible times that give us today hope in tumultuous times. I encourage you to search the Psalms and memorize one of them and sing it in the shower while you're working or at home. When you do this, you'll begin to understand why David was such a great warrior. Because he knew that the weapons of our warfare aren't designed to fight physically, but every stronghold and power that rises up against God's people will be defeated. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4. Learn to sing with joy to God and watch your life grow exponentially because the power of God resides in you to give you the victory. Chapter 6 the triumphant victory. And it came to pass when the king sat in his house and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies. Second Samuel 7 verse 1. Now you have the keys. So enter into God's throne room. I love movies. In the 1990s, there was a film called Juice. It starred Omar Epps. You may remember Omar as character foreman on the TV show House. In Juice, Epps played an inner city team named Q, whose life and friendship changes dramatically after an accidental shooting of another close friend. During one of the scenes towards the end of the film, the character Q, played by Epps, tries to save a former friend turned enemy, played by actor Tupac Shakur, from falling off of the ledge after they both fight on the top of the building. But when Q's hands become too slippery to hold Shakur from plunging off the edge, he slips into the dark night falling from the building. Though Q yells and calls for his friend, there's no response from the darkness. After a few moments, Q balances himself up to walk towards the project building exit on the rooftop, but he turns to his surprise where a group of onlookers were watching quietly. Though jostled, he presses his way on through the crowd. Then the thunderous silence is broken when another kid turns and says to him, you got the juice now. Epps shakes his head senselessly and walks towards the exit. Fade to black, roll credits. A breathtaking scene. It was very emotional. Well, now I'm going to flip that on you. You have to use the juice. These are the keys of David. This is what shaped his spirit, his heart, and his praise in the dance and in the song. David knew he had to reach heaven and move the hand of God in very difficult times. And now you know more than even David because you know Jesus Christ. With knowledge comes the power of greatness. So use that knowledge to accomplish great things for God. You have the power of the Spirit of the Lord. You have the power of prayer in Jesus' name. You have the heart to accomplish the will of God. You can dance over all the powers of the enemy. You can sing the song of rejoicing praise. And you have the victory through Christ Jesus. That's it. Now you're an official kingdom warrior, just like David. So go out and test your armor in battle. You have the faith knowing that you are already a conqueror through the name of Jesus. Because there is power in the name of Jesus. The end.
But wait, you're going to need heaven's help. God assigns help in the form of angels, and you must know how to call on them when you need help. You need to know these six things. How do angels operate? Who are they called to help? Do they have names? If so, what are they? When do I call on angels? Will my angel do whatever I ask him to? What kind of trouble do angels help with when you are at war with darkness that surrounds you on every side? These questions are vital and they need to be answered before you have the victory. Because in the storm of life, you need angelic help to gain the winner's edge over your enemy, the devil. When demons fight your sleep, when your family life is out of control, when your money is acting funny, when your progress towards change is strange, nothing but an angel of God can help you. Find out in my prophetic newsletter the keys you need to unlock angelic powers and the six secrets of calling 12 legions of angels. In this newsletter, you will discover the prosperity assignment of God's angels, angels' food, and his power to sustain you, how angels are assigned to every believer who trusts God, why Jesus didn't call these legions, and why you should. The one angel who can destroy the powers of the enemy, and much more. You must get this newsletter if you want angelic help. Find out how when you visit terrencewilburn.com forward slash newsletter. Enter your email and subscribe. www.terrencewilburn.com forward slash newsletter. And I'll send your PDF newsletter right to your inbox. Go to again, terrencewilburn.com forward slash newsletter to get your free copy today. A $49 value, but you get it today as my gift for free. Thank you. This is your prophetic teacher, Terrence Wilburn. Credits. Disciples and the Power of Faith. How to Make Your Story of Christian Authority and Rise Above Mountains by Terrence Wilburn. Read for you by the author. This has been an audiobook of Disciples and the Power of Faith. How to Make Your Story of Christian Authority and Rise Above Mountains by Terrence Wilburn. Read to you by the author. This has also been a production of Wilburn Media. Copyright 2018, Woolburn Media. Copyright 2018 by Terrence Woolburn.